Good afternoon, everyone. I'm so excited to have everyone join us again today. Um, I hope that many of you participated in the first round of these trainings, this capacity building exercise that we're rolling out here at the Office of Rural Prosperity. Um, we did so many sessions at the beginning of this year to really cover the grassroots basics of economic development. And many of you responded to us and gave us information of really what you would like more of us to do a deeper dive on and to learn more about. So over this summer, you're gonna learn a lot from things from childcare to housing to strategic planning and some of the basics that really help you guys move your community forward um, as you're tackling whatever challenge you might face in your, in your rural town. What we're really excited about is the geographic um, disbursement of everyone who's registered today. So I'm excited to see so many people from both large and small communities across the state, but really predominantly in very rural areas across our, across our area. So um, I like to joke with everyone that I went from being an economic developer in one county to helping now a hundred counties. And there's no way our office of just uh, two to hopefully four soon people um, can handle covering that much territory across our state without your help. So we're really hoping that all of you will join us as part of our team to help grow rural prosperity across our state. With that, I'm gonna kick it off to the person who's done all of the legwork to pull this entire uh, training together, uh, Carrie Folletti, who is our grassroots strategy developer here at the Office of Rural Prosperity. Thank you so much, Carrie. Hi, thank you. Trish, and it looks like we still have a few more joining in. So um, we'll keep welcoming everybody as they get here. But thank you again to everybody who is registered for, for this series. Um, today is looking a little bit different because as we were talking about our planning with our presenters today, we decided, you know, planning and goal setting is something that's much better learned by doing rather than just listening. So today's session is, you know, it's really meant to be that interactive. And as, um, as we go through the process, um, we want, you know, your input and your participation in um, both of the steps of our processes today. Um, and a lot kind of, as Trish was saying, a lot of the information in these sessions was uh, based on feedback from what we heard out of our 101 series. And there's, for our grassroots really is meant for people that are not necessarily, you know, paid to do what they're doing, but find themselves working in communities just across the state. Um, so it's really, you know, anybody that is um, with cities or volunteer organizations, anyone in the community that's really trying to make a difference uh, in your areas. So hopefully uh, if you guys have questions for um, presenters, we're going to be uh, the, using our chat, but as you're looking forward to the sessions that are upcoming as well, email me any questions you have, because um, if there, I want to make sure that you guys get the value out of these sessions, and if there's something that we need to make sure we're covering or addressing, um, then I'll get those questions to our, our speakers coming up, so we can just make sure and add more value as we go. So, uh, looks like, yeah, wow, we just shut up a lot on registration, so hopefully we'll get a lot of people coming in. Uh, a lot of things going on on the screen right now. Sorry about that. Uh, but um, today we're going to be talking um, a lot about the planning, um, how to kind of get your community moving forward, and where to take them. So we're going to start um, with Raquel Beeson with the Kansas Leadership Center. Um, and she is the director of the community partnerships for the Kansas Leadership Center. And she works to support and strengthen the network of local leadership programs throughout the state that collaborate with KLC. As a member of the civic engagement team, she also develops and ex executes st strategies that mobilize KLC alumni who serve in elected and appointed roles to help build civic culture for better progress on tough community challenges in Kansas. KLC is a civic engagement um, initiatives connected to alumni serving as elected and appointed roles are familiar to Rock Health. She was an elected official for 12 years and understands the challenges of exercising leadership while working 
from a position of authority on community issues. Raquel still enjoys serving in her home community of Newton as a board member of Newton Healthcare Corporation and a member of the Kansas, the Central Kansas Community Foundation Scholarship Committee. And assisting Raquel with this first part is Jared. Barton, he serves with the Kansas Leadership Center as a member of the programs team and specializes in technology support. So we really appreciate him today. Um, his passion for leadership development was realized at a young age and he has been seeking out opportunities to grow himself and others in the dis discipline ever since. Jareth believes that leadership is the key to unlocking a future in which people can thrive. Growing up in Woodbine, Kansas, Jareth is uh, skeptical when others claim to be from small towns um, and loves fishing, woodworking, swing dancing, and discussing big issues is always in search of new activities. So really a good fit for today's conversation. So, and then John Devine will take us into our second part today. Um, and I know I've got to know John just a little bit in these last few weeks planning today, but he has been working in strategic planning for over 30 years at several different levels. Um, but his passion is working with our small communities um, to developing their, their vision and achievable action steps. So I'm really excited to have these three with us today to facilitate the discussion. So I am going to hand it off to Raquel and Jared, and I'll let you guys kind of talk about the process and let me know. All right, well, thank you, Carrie, and good afternoon. I am going to make one request right off the bat. If you could please turn on your cameras, <laughs> that would really make this uh, so much more exciting and interactive and I don't have to guess about whether I know you or not. I see names on the screen and I'm pretty sure I know who you are, I'm familiar with you. So I'd love to see the faces to go with the names. Um, speaking of that, there are a lot of friends in here uh, that, uh, that I know well and am grateful. So part of this is I feel comfortable because I'm not gonna be speaking a language that's totally unfamiliar to 51 participants, but maybe half or better, understand what the Kansas Leadership Center is, and this will be um, a familiar language and maybe even a, a super familiar process for some of you. Um, so thank you. I've uh, stalled long enough and many of you have come on screen and I'm really, really appreciative of that. The second request I would make is this is intended to be interactive. Now, if and Carrie and John and Tricia know this. They didn't uh, get Jareth and I here today because we were gonna give you um, a 50 minute uh, slide deck or PowerPoint presentation. That's just not how it works. I don't know that there's ever been a 50 minute slide presentation at the Kansas Leadership Center and we're not gonna be the first to deliver that, <laughs> are we? <laughs> so this is interactive. This is a conversation. Um, it may be, uh, you're here for learning and discovery, particularly if you're new to this work or this is, you know, you're newer in this work. This isn't about um, us. Jareth and I are not economic development experts. Uh, we're process and facilitation um, experienced individuals. I wouldn't even call us experts. We're just experienced individuals in this work. And so we want to have conversation with you today. And that means you have to participate with us. So, um, you know, if you feel compelled uh, to, to participate and put stuff into the conversation, you have a couple of options. One, unmute yourself and get your voice in this uh, virtual room or put, the inf put your response in the chat. That is perfectly acceptable too. Uh, Jareth, while I'm doing most of the talking um, and leading, facilitating the conversation, Jareth's gonna do some screen sharing. And so the things that you are bringing into the conversation are gonna show up. Um, so this, you're, you're going to see what's happening um, in real time. We hope, we, we anticipate that this is a, this first 45 minutes or so is a really nice setup for the work that John's going to take you through um, in the second hour, which is about that strategic um, action step planning. But before we get to figuring out what we need to do or could do or should experiment with, we thought it felt 
um, important, essential to do um, some diagnostic work to begin with. Like what's the point in putting somebody's arm in a cast if it isn't even broken? Like let's solve um, problems that really do exist. <laughs> let's clearly diagnose what the problems are to begin with. Um, and then as folks in economic development or community building um, advocacy kind of work, you are making progress on the real issue, not some you know, false truth about what you think you're solving or making progress on. So that's where we're headed. Um, any questions from anybody, even John, Tricia, Carrie, questions about process or how this is gonna go or what, um, you know, questions about expectations, anything on anyone's mind? Maybe not. Um, no, that sounds really exciting, thank you. Yeah, you bet. So there, I don't know, there we've got, uh, yeah, 63 people in here today. So uh, I'm, I'm not gonna take time. We're not gonna go around and do introductions because time would be up and that would be kind of crazy. But if you're putting something in chat or when you get your voice into the room for the first time, tell us, you know, hey, my name is Raquel and I'm from Newton. And, you know, here, here's what I'm thinking. Uh, get your voice and community in the room for that first, that first time. So maybe that's just, that's sort of the third request. Cameras on if you can, participate actively and give us your name and community when you speak for the first time. Anything else team that I should cover before we jump into this? I'm getting, uh, it looks like we got the go ahead. So uh, what isn't a part of my uh, bio is that I was in Chamber of Commerce and Economic Development work uh, for about 16 years in the community of Newton. And that was before I served as an elected official. And so when I'm particularly excited about this conversation because it's still like that work is still a part of who I am. <laughs> I may not be in that realm specifically anymore, but the fact that I got to participate with you all today and go back and think about, for me, it's going back and thinking about economic development um, community building, community growth and sustainability. I got pretty excited um, when I got asked to participate with this. So um, I'm really looking for um, just honest um, engagement from from everyone. And we're going to do this in a couple of in a couple of different parts. We're going to do something with the Kansas Leadership Center that we call the gap. It's the gap exercise. And we're going to spend time here together uh, getting more clear, like this is won't be the final answer to anything, but we're going to get more clear about what our current, or in your case, what your current realities are in your community around growth and sustainability, economic development related issues. So we're going to talk about current realities, like what's going on, um, specifically things that you're concerned about. Now, I know you might all have a list of, you know, this long of community concerns connected to community growth, economic development, et cetera. But I wanna, I'm gonna force you or push you towards thinking about what concerns you the most. If you looked at that list of 10 or 12 or 80 things, what might you um, bring to their surface as the thing you can, are concerned the most about? Then we're gonna spend some time, we're gonna shift we are thinking and go to the aspirations. When we think about um, our community, economic development, community growth, what aspirations do we have on our minds? And we'll eventually get to this place where there's this nice, well, it's not nice. <laughs> it's a messy gap <laughs> between our current reality, our concerns and our aspirations. And that'll be a nice setup. Like let's figure out what's in the gap, what makes it hard. And that'll be a really great setup then for the work John's gonna do with you. Like, okay, here, here's, this is what we know we're working with, or we know this is what's gonna be hard. And so we're gonna tackle the things that are most hard. Um, so I'm gonna take you back to the first question. And uh, you know, I, I'm really comfortable with that awkward silence that you all might feel when I go quiet and nobody's ready to talk or contribute yet. I'll just let you know, I'm super comfortable with that. And I can sit here for a long time. And if you're going to wait for me to fill that void, ain't going to happen. <laughs> so when you think about the future of this work that you all are involved in, community growth, 
community sustainability, economic development, whatever you want to call it, whatever seat you're sitting in and how you're contributing to that. When you think about that, what are you most concerned about? And this is the point where Jared's going to pop on and we'll start doing some, he's going to, whatever you say or put in the chat bar is going to show up here on this, on this uh, list called concerns. What concerns you the most about economic development and doing this work? Workforce retention. So Rachel says workforce retention. And I saw in the chat and um, start dumping things in here. That's fantastic. Stacy put in apathy. Um, Megan is talking about keeping our downtown viable. Concerned about keeping our downtown viable. Um, Megan, if you could like either put more in chat or come on, to, uh, bring your voice into the room. I'd love to know a little bit more about that. Um, economic development. Um, I'm concerned about the, the shift that we've seen over the last few years to internet purchasing and how do we keep our brick and mortar businesses still active yet get them into the e-commerce space. Yeah, that feels, that's, I love that you went quite a bit more specific there. <laughs> um, well, I mean, concerned about downtown viability, yes, but really what does that mean? You're concerned about brick and mortar stores staying open. You're concerned that uh, online shopping doesn't take over the world more than it already has. <laughs> You're concerned about those mom and pop shops um, being able to stay in business and pass that on to the next generation. That, that's, give me some details like that. What, what's concerning you the most? Keep putting your stuff into the chat, but let's bring some more voices into the room. That's what will make this a super dynamic conversation. And Jareth can only type so fast. <laughs> What's on your mind? I think one of the concerns that, that I have here in Neodice is I've got land for housing and I have recruited a business. I just have about 600 people a day driving into my community that can't live here due to lack of housing. So we don't have contractors. If, if we had people that could actually do the work um, and build the homes for the people that we need them for our community could grow and and thrive even more but we just can't seem to get those types of of people in town you know to work it's it's hard right it's not just a lack of housing available but it's a lack of people to build housing is that what you're saying jerry yes yeah Oh, and so Tracy's put in here, adequate housing to match workforce needs. What do you mean by that? Sure, so um, we just did a housing needs analysis and we found that our employers are not paying at a level of some of the housing that's available. And on the other spectrum, we have housing available that is not really adequate for, for what these folks are actually bringing in on a monthly paycheck. So the majority of our workforce is not making a doctor's pay, but that's the type of housing we might have available. Whereas a, a doctor's pay, some of the housing we have doesn't necessarily match what they would like to live in. So we're, we're having a gap between what's there and what's not and what folks can afford. Sure. Yes, yeah, so there's some mismatch in terms of need and availability. I'm looking at the list as you all might be. Um, I'm, I'm 
particularly interested in this uh, not doing enough. Who said that and what do you mean by that? Who's not doing enough? And I know I'm putting you all on the spot when I ask point blank questions like this and forgive me, but. That, that would be Roger Ravi. Hey, Roger. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Um, you know, I just, uh, I, guess, I guess it's a concern after doing this as many years as I have. Um, you begin to question a little bit about whether you're doing the right thing or whether the things that you are doing uh, are being effective enough. And, and that is just kind of exacerbated by things that have gone on over the last couple of years, especially, and, and whether uh, you've created a it's going to, uh, to weather those storms. Uh, you know, and, and we, we're all, we, anybody that's been in economic development uh, for any length of time knows, knows that it's a roller coaster. Uh, and, uh, but that's something that you never really get used to. Uh, you hope that eventually you create something that's going to be going up and, and not having those big dips that we so often have. Okay, thank you for chiming in more there. Is there anything that's showing up on this list that's surprising to anyone? Or something that you already, that your community isn't dealing with? Or your organization? Maybe you're not directly in economic development. But I, I, mean, I think I saw folks on the list from, uh, you know, child care, uh, maybe a few other nonprofit type organizations. Uh, just, just wondering, what, what are you thinking about what you're seeing on this list? What's your reaction to this? I keep noticing that there's a lot of, you know, the income's not keeping up with the housing costs and affordable housing, that sort of thing. And that is a very real problem. Unfortunately, with the cost of materials and the lead time of materials right now, I, I don't know how you keep up. These high income, some of our industries are starting people out at $17 an hour. That's a decent wage in this area, but it's still not going to touch the cost to build a home at today's prices. We're, we're pushing almost $200 a foot to build. And these companies, I don't think are gonna be able to pay these people that $17 an hour, zero experience walking in off the street. That's not sustainable in my opinion. So it, I don't know what that answer is, but it is very concerning to me. Well, I think that um, brings up, a, I'm trying to see if it's on the list in this form, but, um, you know, the way in which we're filling those vacant positions today may not be sustainable. And that, if, if I was still in this work, um, that would feel pretty daunting to me. You know, I was thinking, I was had um, here in Dodge City today and it was in the Leadership Dodge City program this morning and we were talking about workforce development uh, and, you know, recruiting and retention and there was conversation about uh, the necessity of employers having to sh make shifts in their own thinking and behavior <laughs> about how to recruit and retain um, and change their mindset and beliefs and these deeply held values about what employees today should be doing or not doing, and et cetera, et cetera. Yeah, so maybe maybe there is some, maybe that idea Caleb put in here, complacency. Maybe complacency shows up in all kinds of ways in communities. Complacent employers not willing to change their hiring models, complacent community members that, you know, I don't know, you've probably all, you know, you probably call them the same thing, but those cave people, you know, citizens against virtually everything. Uh, complacent in, you know, they have no clue what's going on. Some people know, you know, when they want to know all the business and some people don't want to know any of it. <laughs> and neither is particularly helpful.
Yeah, this think, is a, go ahead. I'd say here in McPherson, I'd say that's a huge issue. We've got individuals that um, we, we can't fill a lot of the service level jobs because we've got a lot of manufacturing, which is great, but um, there's just not enough people and filling service level jobs and having to be, be sustainable from a, from a amenity standpoint with, with uh, businesses and uh, retail businesses, shopping opportunities, th things of that. It's really hard to fill that because everybody's right now pushing to pay and compensate people higher because the workforce is so short. It, we've got to find some way to, to boost that. If, if industry and if, if things like that are going to continue to grow, you've got to, we've got to find more people and that comes with housing. Um, you know, I, I don't know if there's anybody that lives in rural Kansas that doesn't have a shortage of housing. Um, finding a way to, a better way to do that and do it in a more affordable manner and, you know, the developers and builders to do it all is, is not easy. Yeah. Yeah, which, which one of these concerns do you tackle first? <laughs> And maybe that maybe that's what John's going to help you do later. <laughs> John, you got all the answers. answers. That's awesome. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, this um, 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 this it's a sobering list, and I know I, I don't want to spend too much time here because <laughs> it could make everybody really unhappy and <laughs> like, oh gosh, how do we keep going? But is there anything that you would you think needs to be on this list yet? Concerns you the most? If I can just say, um, one thing that is on the list that I haven't heard a lot of people talking about is the child care issue. And the way that I've tried to approach it in our community is if we can get quality child care centers open, then hopefully that will inspire more people to go to work. But but childcare is extremely expensive. So you know, the line worker, twelve dollars an hour may not be able to afford one hundred twenty dollars a week. Um, so you know, I feel like one problem would help fix another problem. You fix childcare, maybe that'll fix the workforce, which would maybe help the housing. You know, and it's just kind of this circle. But. I know I'm doing a concentrated effort right now trying to get a hold of potential daycare providers and just trying to start there. Um, and I do know some companies in Southeast Kansas have started what they call the mommy shift, which is allowing people to drop off their kids at school, come and work however many hours they're able, and then go back and pick their child up. So it's taking that childcare expense out of their, out of their way. You know, they're just able to work when the kids are or at school and then they, um, you know, pick them up afterwards. So then the employer is, is having a more loyal employee. I'm working with you and if the kids get older, it's a non-issue with the childcare and then they're a full-time employee with regular hours. To back that up, I was in a webinar the other day and it says 4.2 million women dropped out of the labor force between February, 2020 and April, 2021. And nearly two million of those haven't returned. So that's when you talk about labor shortage, that's that's a huge part. We've got finding daycare and and maybe uh, creative ways for how we can handle that from a business industry and employer standpoint is is critical. I think I'd also say that negativity, whoever wrote that down is 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 a real key because when you have a you know, when you have a sense that nothing's changing and things aren't getting better, it really plays into a lot of the issues that are on this list. Um, and it certainly plays into apathy and getting people involved in your community. And that's really ultimately the key is getting community support and having, you know, good community relations to, to want to invest in their community, both financially and, you know, with their time, talent and treasure. Yeah, that's something I don't see on here is community support, community engagement. Uh, <laughs> the level of volunteerism, uh, the, the quantity and quality of elected officials that are deeply in the mix of economic development, decision making. Um, 
I, yeah, I, I agree that this, this isn't going to be an exhaustive list of concerns and we could keep going, but I wanna shift gears a bit because we still need to get to this other side of the, the equation, which are the aspirations. And so we're gonna go through the same motion here. When you think about the future of your community, the, 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 if you think about the future or the industry of economic development, what are your aspirations? If we were getting it right, what would it look like? So put things into chat, get your voices into the room. And we're gonna create a, hopefully a, a, a big list, just like we did with concerns. What are your aspirations? What does success look like? I'm scanning the, what's happening in the chat here. Where's Chris Heinze? I'm interested in this, more people working together instead of their own corners. Would you say more about that? What's that? Okay, I am in a noisy restaurant, so I don't know <laughs> if you can hear me. I'm Chris Heinze from Lincoln. Um, I am the marketing coordinator for the economic development uh, here, so I'm, I'm not the foremost uh, authority here, <laughs> but I'm learning. So one of the things I see is that a lot of people are working in their own little corner. They want they want to see change. They want to see yeah. something improve, um, but they're not getting hooked up with leadership. They're not getting hooked up with organizations that already exist. Uh, they're just trying to do their own little thing in their own little corner. And I constantly try to steer people back to working together or getting hooked up with an organization that is doing something or could use more help or needs more volunteers. So I think that uh, that would help maybe get us a little closer to some of our bigger goals. Okay. Okay. I hear that. This isn't about creating, not necessarily about creating more resources and tools and opportunities and organizations, but it's uh, sure. leveraging better the things that are already in existence. Mm -hmm. Leveraging more. Uh, I, I agree with everything else that everybody else is saying too. So uh, more prosperity and better quality of life for everybody, definitely. When you're thinking about, so the people that you um, are connected with in your community, the people that are doing this work alongside you, uh, the residents that you are doing this work uh, with in communities. What do you, talk to me a bit about um, uh, skill set, behavior. What do you wish, how do you wish people were showing up? What do you wish they were doing <laughs> that they're not today? What would you like to see more of in terms of skills and behaviors, attitudes, values, beliefs. If we were getting it right, what kind of, what would you see happening? How would you see people behaving? I've, Raquel, I've seen a few comments here and, and I've 
put them down as collaboration before. I'm, I'm curious to people though, what, do, what does collaboration look like to you? Maybe can you walk us through like, what do you see when people are collaborating in your community? So you're asking them to get really clear about that. Name, name the behaviors of collaboration. Yeah, what does that look like to you? I mean, is that people coming together in community meetings? Is um, going out for coffee in the morning with the business owner next door? What does that look like to you? For me, it means, uh, you know, more open dialogues and, you know, and, and, most, and whether it's business, the business side, whether it's the community as a whole and the leaders, whether they're the elected officials or just various community leaders getting together and talking about what it takes to become, what it takes to become a more attractive community for, for people to live in. Yeah, and sometimes open dialogue means um, we have to surface tough issues. <laughs> we have to talk about the, the elephants in the room. Part of it's putting aside your, your uh, you know, if you've got set feelings on this is, this is how it needs to be done, getting those people in a room and getting the opportunity for those people to, you know, to push aside kind of their own agendas and, and, and come together and, and, and try to find a solution. Yeah, I, I like uh, what Caleb said, community, mem community members teach each other the skills they have and are wanting to learn skills they don't. <laughs> like I have something to offer because I've been around the block and I, I'm willing to pass that on, but I'm also willing to be vulnerable and say out loud, I don't know how to do this. Could somebody help me get better at that? That, Caleb, maybe that's not where you were headed, but that is my interpretation of what you put in the chat. And if I'm, if I'm dead wrong, Hop in here and tell me what you were thinking. No, that's exactly what I was thinking. I mean, just as a simple example, um, you know, I was thinking about you look to your neighbor and they have a nice, vibrant garden um, and you don't have anything. You know, hey, I'd like to learn how to garden. And you have the nice, uh, nice front looking porch or something like that that you built yourself and your neighbor that has the garden doesn't help each other out and teach each other how to do things like that. Okay. Yeah, sharing knowledge and being vulnerable and asking for help. <laughs> if we were getting if we were getting it more right more often. <laughs> Those I would like to see more people in our community get involved. It seems like you have the same handful of people that are involved in everything. And there's a whole community with opinions and great ideas, but nobody's hearing them because for whatever reason, they're, they're not involved in the discussions. And, and that could be because they don't want to be, or that be, could be because they haven't been invited or, or nothing's really inspired them. But you know, a very simple idea can do wonderful things if, if we could just get everybody together. Yeah, so yeah, one aspiration could be uh, we're creating a space or a culture in our community um, in that where new voices feel welcome, that divergent thinking <laughs> is okay that uh, the newcomers to town that have been there for 40 years now aren't seen as newcomers anymore. <laughs> they, they, might have, <laughs> they might have some vested interest by now after a half a decade. <laughs> like creating a space, creating a community culture where that, you know, people feel welcome. Other aspirations that feel important to name here. We'll take a couple of more and then we're gonna shift gears. You 
people with vision and endurance, hmm. move ideas to community improvement projects. How visual improvements inspire others. Sure. Like we talk at Kansas Leadership Center, we talk about, you know, how do you mobilize others? Well, sometimes it's, I think that really great porch, <laughs> it mobilizes the neighborhood to, you know, like, how do you mobilize? How do you energize others? Eric is saying, I want to see people taking the initiative. Yeah, and sometimes asking for help is that initiative that needs to be taken. Anything else you want to put on this list before we move to part three here? And if something comes up, put it in the chat and Gareth will get it added. One, this, this conversation is being recorded, but two, I'm guessing the chat will be, content from the chat will be available if somebody really wants it after the fact. Okay, so let's shift to uh, the, the heart of this exercise, which is called, uh, th this is the gap. It's that space in between our, our concerns and our aspirations. And it's, the gap is, uh, contains, the, it contains the stuff. <laughs> that makes getting from concerns to aspirations so difficult. Like if we, if we were getting it all right and we had everything that we wanted, um, we wouldn't have this list of concerns and aspirations. We would already be checking everything off the aspirations list. But I'm curious what you all think makes it hard to make progress on these issues. And yes, Natalie, funding is part of it. This attitude of not in my backyard is part of it. What do you mean fear, Nadine? A lot of times it's the unknown people. Um, they don't know what to expect to happen or just of how it's gonna affect them in the So people are, if people don't know, like at the end, what's uncertain or unknown causes people to pull back or hold back. And if people are holding back then the difficult conversations, naming the elephant, those things might not happen readily because people are afraid. Yes. Yeah. And a lot of times it's a fear monger who um, will increase that amongst people within the community and uh, not allow new things to happen. Those of you that are in economic development, community growth and sustainability work, what makes it hard for you? I mean, part of the, yes, funding and money, that, that, that's, those will always be issues. But even if we had all of the funding and all of the resources available to us, what would still make your work difficult? like beliefs that things will fix themselves, right? We just bury our head in the sand <laughs> and pretend like these things don't exist. <laughs> and we'll just keep doing the things we've been doing for the last three decades. And then be frustrated when nothing changes. Now, I mean, I'm taking a lot of liberty here. <laughs> So don't, don't uh, and I, I, I say, it, I'm, I'm, some of this is telling on myself and I, you know, I was in economic development work and I was that 
you know, that, that uh, elected official who maybe didn't always contribute in a helpful way to economic development conversations. And so I'm, you know, in some ways I'm outing myself here. Yeah, Rachel, I, this is interesting. Small town person, personality clashes and old grudges. Say more about that if you would. I don't know if I can without getting in trouble. Um, uh, but yeah, like it just seems like there are sometimes part, people trying to achieve a similar goal but they see each other as competition instead of collaborators. Even if it's something where it's like, you're not even gonna make money on this. You just want the credit for you and not the other person because you don't get along. And I mean, that's just, I mean, yeah. Okay. I, I don't know what else to say with that. No, I, I'm, I, I'm sorry, I put you on the spot and yeah. I appreciate you leaning in and saying, look, I might, I get in trouble for saying this. Like, I'm guessing anybody in this conversation today could get in trouble for saying anything. <laughs> this is hard work. Um, I like the way, Jareth, I appreciate what you did. You said, you named it this, like the us versus them dynamics. It, they just exist and that makes this hard. And figuring out, uh, like there is no, there's no book. There's no economic development guidebook that says if you do these 10 things on this checklist because the experts say so then all of your us versus them dynamics will be solved in your community like there there isn't expertise out there like that and so these you know these are these are the, the things that are showing up in the gap are adaptive challenges that you're confronted with every single day and you're figuring out like how to, how to make progress in a community, how to be sustainable, how to grow, how to be viable, not just, you know, surviving, but thriving. And you've got all of this stuff that makes it hard to do that. Some of you that I know better than others, Stacy, Roger, Carrie, Nadine, like you, you're my uh, community leadership program friends. <laughs> and we talk about this in community leadership program work all the time. What's not on this list that you think should be? What makes, what makes exercising leadership difficult? Yeah, social media battlefields, heck yeah. Because yeah, I kind of go back to how Nick said, lack of risk takers, developers, business owners, et cetera. I mean, some of these things, it's going to take looking at things in a new way, and someone has to be brave enough to be the one to step out and do some of this work, and that is definitely risk taking, um, and that goes right along with some, you know, our leadership things as well, um, and how to get that support in the community to make some of these changes where that first comment and NIMBY, you know, and citizens against virtually everything and, and that kind of, it's, it's tough. So yeah, this is, it's a lot of good things on the list. You mentioned lack of risk taking. There's a person who puts the idea out there. And then there's also the person who has to be the first follower who's willing to take the risk to say, yeah, I agree with what um, they're proposing. <laughs> yeah, what, what, if you, what if you put your, uh, your backing and efforts behind the wrong idea? <laughs> there's risk in doing that. I mean, it may turn out well, and it might not, but somebody's got to, like we, at the leadership center, we talk about exercising leadership as I mean, one of the, the, the fundamental principles is it starts with you and you must engage others. And how you engage others <laughs> um, can be a real difference maker in 
the work that you all are doing and getting closer to those aspirations that you have. Right? Like you, you're not, you're not working on an island all by yourself in your community or your region. Yeah. How are you, how are you getting those? How are you getting more voices? Are you identifying more voices? Who are the, who are the stakeholders? How are you going to get them? How do you energize the, you know, the, the, the grumpy people in town? There's a lot of hard stuff in the gap. I also think the, uh, the understanding of the difference between uh, adaptive and technical fixes is something because typically uh, what I run into is, is uh, when having these serious group discussions that you will get from people that uh, maybe aren't educated in the leadership uh, ideals uh, will try to put technical fixes to uh, problems when um, there's needs to be a more adaptive approach. And, and I just, I'll just use consolidation as an example of that because uh it boils down to it, uh, that is a very adaptive uh, problem. You're, you, people are going to be giving up a lot uh, with that, but uh, that may be the best uh, way to do it is, uh, is if they can get past the, the part of it that just a technical fix, okay, consolidating schools, just build a new school, that'll take care of it and then in the middle, but uh, it's deeper than that. No doubt. I like what Greg or Nick said from McPherson, sometimes the vision is not clear enough to get everyone on the bus. <laughs> right? The vision, your purpose has to be clear or clear enough. <laughs> that people understand at least the direction you're headed. Kind of like what Carrie Bradley said. I wonder if you want to dig into that a little bit. It's, it's Carrie Bradley and then Sam Moon here today. Hi. <laughs> Hi. <laughs> um, so, if you're talking about the comment we made about social media being a battlefield for even the easy victories and um, trying to get people to understand how things work, not just that we're doing them. Um, you know, we have money coming in from different places, which is great and we're so excited about it, but we have people not understanding how the funding works. And so they think that we can only do one project at a time. They think that we're not focusing on critical infrastructure because we're doing soft infrastructure and like, you know, public art projects. Well, we're doing both. One's just funner to look at than the other. So trying to get people to understand that all these things could be happening at the same time and we're not just funneling our attentions or siloing our projects. So that, that's been kind of what we're fighting over here lately. Yeah, the, uh, the economic development uh, <laughs> taxpayer dollar, Etc. learning curve is steep and it's hard to get a majority of community members uh, to be, you know, <laughs> educated, informed, and at the same starting place that you are. You know, that, that's, a, that's something, you know, starting where they are, whoever they are in, in the, you know, and related to the issue or the concern or the, the community challenge, uh, starting where they are is hard work. And oftentimes the expectation is, well, they need to get, they need to get up to speed to where we are. And sometimes it's just the opposite. We've got to go back <laughs> and start where they are in order yeah. to bring them along. We've talked in, in our organization about developing like a citizens academy because we're seeing so much development in our community for the first time in a long time. Um, a lot of our residents either have never been exposed to it or it's been literally, you know, 20 or 30 years since our last round of development. So they're out of touch with how things work. We've thought about getting together with our community partners or our county partners and doing kind of a citizens academy just to introduce them to 
how we work today. Yeah, that gets, we're getting into uh, like strategic action steps, which I'm gonna, we're gonna save that work for John. But uh, I want you to be thinking about that in, in preparation for this second half. Like what are those technical things that we might be able to uh, bring to bear? <laughs> what, point, what kinds of programs and resources and opportunities do we need to create or uh, beef up? And what are some of those beliefs and values and behavioral challenges that we need to address also? We talk about uh, faction maps a lot inside KLC and businesses and organizations, communities that we're working with. We, we get people to think about no matter what the community issue is. And let's say in this case, it's economic development. There are factions all over the community or groups of like-minded stakeholders that care about economic development in whatever ways they care about it. And they have their own, those groups of like-minded thinkers have their own set of values and loyalties that may, uh, may line up with the economic development work you're doing, but it may be in direct contrast to the work that you're doing. And so when we're thinking about making progress and getting closer to the realization of all of these aspirations on the right hand side of the page here, we have to, we have to engage those stakeholders and help them. We, one, we have to get to know what their values and loyalties are, just like we want them to get to know what ours are. But we also have to do the really hard work of talking about the loss that they may experience or the loss we might experience in the economic development uh, arena, the loss that might be felt when progress is actually made, right? I mean, you may have a community um, and um, many people think that more housing, more job growth, bringing in businesses, uh, you know, taking the population from, you know, 18,000 to 25,000 is a good thing. And they can't even imagine any sort of loss being felt in doing so. But I promise you, there will be people in the community that one say, uh, heck no, that's not the direction we want it to go. Or if it is going that direction, they're experiencing some loss. And so for every new business that comes to town or every new housing developer that you know gets their license to build <laughs> in your community, that means there's some loss that other builders or other business owners or other neighborhoods or other, you know, long-term residents, like people might feel loss when you're making progress um, and growing or just at the very least sustaining the community. And that when we don't tackle or we don't address that loss that people might experience, um, it will make it really hard to close the gap between concerns and aspirations. You know, when people feel threatened, um, they just dig in their heels even harder. And then you've got a whole different set of, a whole different kind of work to do. We're at 2.32 and I need to transition out here. But I encourage you to keep adding to the chat if it feels right for you where you're headed next is to begin thinking about like here this what we've just spent an hour doing is pausing pushing pause long enough <laughs> to do some diagnosis like what's really happening what are we concerned about and what are aspirations and what gets in the way of that that's diagnostic work and lots of times we don't spend enough time there we just want to jump to solutions because that feels better <laughs> It feels like progress. And my proposal, I think part of the reason why the Kansas Leadership Center was asked to participate today and why we suggested this activity is that it, it, it forces us to pause and maybe roll back just a bit so that you can know better 
um, or be more mindful about what it is you think you need to make progress on. And that's where John comes in because he's gonna help you think about what are those, okay, here's what we're dealing with. Now what action steps or experiments or strategic planning uh, needs to happen in economic development in your community in order to realize some of the aspirations. So with that, my piece is, uh, is complete. I always welcome feedback and conversation and questions. Um, I'll put my name and, and email in the chat, but I'm gonna turn it over to you, John, because I think you're gonna take it away. And you're on mute. <laughs> you're way more effective when we can hear you, John. <laughs> There I am. There you are. <laughs> <laughs> oh, thank you. That, yeah, um, that really hit the spot. I hate to say it. There was about 10 or 12 times I wanted to come on because the participants, the issues and the questions you were asking were all the right ones. And I think that's really, really critical as, as we move forward. Um, just to begin with, let me give you a little understanding. Oh, I see what I did too. Uh, who John Devine is. I spent 25 years with IBM. Uh, I was the city commissioner and mayor of Salina, have been president of the Kansas League of Cities. The last six years with IBM, I was responsible for local government relations in the US and Canada. So my vocation and avocation are local government. And then as all of you who are in local government know, you spend a lot of time doing volunteer stuff. So I've been on almost every board in Salina, I've been on, uh, was uh, president of the Kansas Arts Commission, was president of the Kansas League of Cities. And so, uh, and then the last 20 years, my organization, the leadership firm, I work with nonprofits and with local governments and those entities that are, that are related to those two. Um, <clears throat> we will probably not be as interactive as I would like. Normally we're looking at this process that we're talking about of taking uh, three to four hours. And one of the things too, normally when I work with, and some of your communities I've worked with, uh, I like to do a one-on-one -on -one interview, first of all, with all participants. And some of these techniques uh, you'll want to consider uh, a number of times it came up, how do we get people more engaged, more involved in the community and in organizations? One of the steps, and just to throw another little point, I'm a little abstract, so I may bounce a little bit more. Uh, Raquel is very structured, which I love, uh, but uh, so I may bounce around a little bit because there were some points that came up Whenever possible, <clears throat> when you're trying to bring a group together within your community, try to find somebody to facilitate that who is not a participant. You have three or four things happen when you or someone in your organization, a lot of times you'll see groups where the mayor is gonna facilitate or the economic development director is gonna facilitate. Well, what happens is if that, when that does take place, those folks are either going to direct it in the direction they think it are going to, is going, should go, or they're not going to participate at all. And they're the value participants in those activities. And so what happens, you end up missing on a lot of uh, activities that needs to go on. The other thing is with a, with a facilitator, in a sense, they can ask the dumb questions the wise, and so if you have some conflict in the community, they, they can go ahead and ask the question, why is it we don't come together? This seems so logical or this seems so illogical. Why are you not together in, on, on this case? So that's just one thought to think about as you're, as you're moving forward with any organization. Uh, <clears throat> we're gonna talk a lot about process today because I'm uh, if you can have a consistent process you use on moving your organization forward 
it helps you. It helps everybody that, that's engaged and involved. Uh, Jared, you want to put throw up that first? And and my normally I use flip charts, so I've I've got pretty simple uh, things you're going to get to see. But probably the most critical thing that you can do is develop a vision. And the vision can be written, or I like to draw pictures. I normally will ask everybody to draw a picture of what they want, their organization, their community, their economic, what do you want it to look like in five years? Uh, 25 years ago, we used to talk about long-term strategy is 10 or 15 years out. Now we talk three to five years. But what, what you want that vision to be is so that everyone in the room and all participants and hopefully everyone in the community can come together and feel comfortable that this is what we want our organization, our community, our economic development, our housing, whatever that focus is, this is what we want it to look like. And the reason the why in developing a, a vision is it starts letting everybody come together and we can start then putting together the steps or the goals to make that vision a reality. But what happens I see so many times <clears throat> is we come together to solve a problem, but the problem to begin with is so narrow and we can't get everybody to buy in on it. If we can start out with that larger vision that says, and, and I know one of the things said, you know, we'd like to take our community from 18 to 25,000. So what's our community going to look like at 25,000? Why do we want to go to 25,000? And we've got to have the reasons through that vision that the person that says, oh, but I don't, I, I don't want any change. I moved to this community because my kids could go out and ride their bicycles. And if we go from 18 to 25, I don't know if they can walk home from high school or from grade school or not. The vision is bigger than that. It says, here's what we want to be as a 25,000 population community but this is what that vision will look like. Our kids will still be happy. Our families will be happy because there's more jobs, there's more opportunity, there's more housing, possibly there's more daycare. And that's the thing then that we wanna, that we wanna get into. And so, as I said, the first spot activity that any group wants to do is to develop a vision. Jared, am I, all I've got is the one, I don't have any screens or anything. I've got Am a, I coming through? Yeah. Okay, good. Thank you. Um, and so, and, and the other thing when I ask, anytime you have a question, either come in or send a chat to Jared, because I'd, I'd, I'd like to talk about any of these topics much longer and much more in depth if you've got something as it relates to them. Then next, and Jerry, let's go to the next. Uh, you want to create, and, and most of you have mission statements, but is the mission statement simple enough, direct enough that everybody in your organization, in your community knows what it is? You know, and for a community, it may just be, I would like Salina to be a safe, enjoyable place to live where I can, where people can do the activities they'd like to do. Too many times we see mission statements that are really developed more as marketing statements. And so organizations use them to show off to people, but nobody ever lives them. And you've got to have a mission statement that that's people going to, are willing to live with. And so that's, that's kind of the next thing. But, but again, you have that vision, you know what the mission is, and now, now kind of in a sense, let's get into the work. And first thing that you want to look at is when you have your vision, 
come back and decide not over four, normally even two or three, what will things look like that will show you have reached your vision? And if your vision is to increase housing, then you need to have very specific. We will know when we have added 20 new homes for moderate income, and depending on the community, from 100 to 140,000 homes in our community, we have reached our vision. That is one of the steps in our vision that we've got to do. But you need to have some very specific objectives and goals. And the first step is knowing what that's going to look like. So you, you want to dis describe those three or four things that you're going to have take place that when you get there, if that vision is five years, you want to know I, these things I'm going to see. We've done it. We've made progress. And, and without that, you're continually bouncing all over the, all over the floor. At, when we get towards the end, I'm going to give you a couple of examples of two communities, uh, one in Kansas, one out of Kansas, what they've done and, and, and what it takes. Something else that, uh, and, and let's go to the goals. Okay. After you have the vision, this is the next critical step. What are the goals that we're gonna to have to take that are gonna help us get there? And again, you want three to four goals at most. Because if you have more than that, nothing ever gets done. And you've all been there. You've all been in organizations where you've got all these great things you need to do and they're all wonderful. But what happens, you never get done. They need to be very simple. You know, if daycare is an issue, you need to understand how many daycare slots do we need? And then how are we going to, and our goal is if we need 20 daycare slots in our community, so 20 families can have people out working in the community, then that should be our goal. We need to have, our goal is to have 20 daycare spots in, in line. And I normally look to set your goals three to four years out. We found out that with most organizations and most people, if you set your goals on a one-year basis, the, the, the bigger goal, the first time the conflict comes up and you see you can't get it done, all of a sudden the goal is left, it is no longer out there. So what, what I recommend that you look at doing is setting your, setting your goals up with a three-year plan to get there. So that if something happens in the first year, you can still online and, and know that you can, you can get to the goal. And you don't, uh, especially when you're looking at community-wide goals, it's surprising something happens in the community and for three months, nobody's looking at one of your vision goals. And now by the time you get back to it, you can look and say, well, there's no way we can get that done this year. Organizations do that a whole lot. We're going to talk about year goals and month goals. The other, it needs to be very clear. It needs to be simple, but it needs to be clear. We want to have 20 additional daycare spaces available for our community by 2025. And, 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 and so Nobody has any questions. Nobody can say, well, wait a minute, we're not here, we're not there. And then next, it has to be written. If you're going to have goals, they've got to be written <clears throat> and, and visible to everybody. The other two things you wanted to have your goals do, and every, every activity you do, does it bring value to our organization? And does it help us reach our goals? There are a lot of times <clears throat> when you have multiple choices to make. And what happens if it's a choice between a good and a bad decision, that's, that's really not a choice. We always make the good decision. But if we have two really good decisions to make, critical to make, and one of which of those two you take 
is which one brings the most value to the organization, but also the one that helps us reach our goal or our vision. Because if one of the one of the the decisions is really good for the community temporarily, but it doesn't help us in any way reach that long-term vision, then what we're doing, we're taking energy away from the long-term vision. And that's the thing that we don't want to do. We want to stay online. We want to stay involved. We want to stay engaged. And so as you're looking, you've got to sit down. And again, this, <clears throat> this is where a process is so important is we start looking at how do we put these down? How do we, and, and, and they're shared. You want everybody that's involved in the activity that is trying to make something happen involved in setting the goals. Because that's the other thing that happens. If I've had input and say in those goals, in those time frames, in what we're trying to, what our vision is, it becomes an awful lot harder for me four or five months or six months or a year and a half from now when somebody says, hey, John, I need you to step up and do this. Well, I didn't really agree. Oh, wait a minute. You, you were there. You had the chance to say no. You had the chance to let us know that something else happened. So you want to have everybody that's going to be involved in the process long term there when you're setting your goals when you're setting and, and, and developing that vision. Then from here, and I think you're there, I think we've got another slide. Yeah. This is where it gets real, uh, I wanna say involved, but you wanna sit down first of all at the beginning of the year or the beginning of the period and look and say, what is it in the next 12 months that we can do that will bring value to the community and help us reach our vision? What are those steps? What are those actions that we need to take that will help us get to that point. Then we take that to the next step and we look monthly. What do I wanna do this month? What do I wanna do in June that is gonna help me reach basically my long-term vision, my 12 months goals, and what are the actions that I need to take this month to make those a reality? And each one becomes a little simpler, a little easier, but part of what happens too, if I've got those yearly goals, I can look and say, what did I do this month? Or what do I wanna do this month that's going to give me the steps that will let me reach that, that, that year goal, which in turn will move me towards the vision that we have for our community. Take that down into a weekly basis, <clears throat> same concept. What do I need to do this week? What are the steps that I need to take this week that if I don't get them done, I'm, I'm, I'm putting, slowing down the whole process. And so many times we all have good intent and we think we're gonna do something, you gotta write it down. You've got to know specifically. And then we start out, uh, I, I prefer doing it the night before, but the first thing in the morning, what do I have to do this day that is going to let me get to that point? The, the, the other thing that you would need to be sure, and this is the next, uh, slide Jared. is you need to track what you're doing. You need to take the time and some way follow and track every step that's being done, who, who has committed to doing it, where are they at, what's the process, 
one of the things I like to see that we do sometimes, instead of asking somebody, you know, a, a week before somebody is, if you've got a meeting coming up or you've got a, a deadline coming up, about a week ahead of time, send out an email. You know, John, I'm really excited about hearing your report next week. Or John, I'm really excited about hearing where, where we're at on finding a couple of developers to come into town to start building houses. And just said, instead of just a note, John, do this, kind of kind of give me a heads up, but let, let people know that I am, I am ready, willing, and excited about hearing what, you, what you've got coming up. Any, I've been going here, any questions, any thoughts? We haven't had any questions in the chat yet, but if anybody has any, just go ahead and drop them. Okay. And, and then, Jared, if you the last is when you've gone through the process, celebrate your successes. That's a quick overview the process and Jared, you can go to the uh, open where we just show everybody. Yeah, or uh, no, let's go to uh, where we show the faces. Oh, I see, okay. Yeah, okay, good. Thoughts or comments so far? Hey, John, I'm curious, when you do that visioning um, exercise in the beginning where you said you'd like people to, to draw their uh, visions, do you categorize those into, you know, like areas of, of development, like uh, child, you know, children and school age students and housing and see where their visions come within those categories or do you just let it go kind of a free for all? Let it, <clears throat> let it go free for all. What, what I normally do, we start out and everyone literally draws a map or draws a picture of their organization, what it'll look like in five years. And sometimes in a community, I've had to go all the way from just a whole bunch of smiley faces to a daycare center, new streets, a community uh, theater, but you want people, one of the things that happens when we get together as a community, there's a real tendency to almost very quickly want to focus instead of looking at that broader picture, first of all. And so I start out looking at the broad picture. What's your vision for your community three to five years or your organization three to five years out there. And then we can start getting people as a group. And you know, if we're looking with a city commissioner or city council, you're normally looking six to 10 people. And it is surprising how different those looks can be. And what it also does by developing that vision, it gives you a chance for everybody in the in the leadership group to understand where each person is coming from. And so <clears throat> do not start out with that narrow. Now we'll, as, as we go through, we'll probably narrow it down and talk individually about each of those items on the vi in the vision pictures. Is that, Marianne, does that help you? Okay, yeah. yeah. Thank you. Some other questions? Yes. Yeah. Um, so you were talking about getting someone sort of neutral at um, community meetings where you're discussing what the community could be. Yes. Um, how do you find that neutral person who knows the community well enough to know what people are talking about maybe, but like isn't going to be like, oh, and I think, well, you know, like who, how do you do that? 
Yep. Sometimes what you want to do, uh, the leadership group, there, there's some folks that, but in reality, you don't want someone with too much information. Occasionally there've been, especially in Salina, there's some nonprofits that I prefer not to do any work with because I don't care how good I am. I have a hard time separating myself from what I know about either the people involved or the organization. Because a, a good facilitator, kind of there's kind of three things that they need to do. They need to make sure everybody participates. They need to make sure that nobody dominates and they need to make sure that all of the issues get on the table. And if I come in with preconceived notions, it's awfully easy for me to leave things off the table. And so my recommendation normally is that you're not going to want to have uh, somebody that's too connected because if they're too connected, then all of a sudden, and, and uh, Carol, where, 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 is you, where are you from? Or Rachel Moore? Sorry, I'm, uh, I'm working out of Allen County. So down okay. in the Southeast corner, Iola. Yeah. So what you may even want to do is look at if uh, there may be somebody within within the area that that would be willing to get involved for that that period of time. One of the things I've started doing too is, and it's just part of you don't have a choice, is if and and this has to do with the accountability side of it. Is normally if I come in and we do a retreat. I then come back once a quarter for the next four quarters. And I, I, the reason I do that, and it, I used to, it used to be an option and I was working with an organization. And when I got through, and this was in the very beginning when I first started and I was still doing for for profit, some for profit, I had the owner of a company walk out to the car with me uh, after we'd done a review. And I was so impressed. I thought, my golly, they've gotten a lot done in three months. And when we were walking out to the car, the owner of the business started laughing. It was a spring day and we were talking and I know him. And he said, if you knew how much work we've done the last two weeks, we would have had nothing done. We, the whole work that we'd gone through and spent a whole day working on where our vision is, what our goals are, how we're gonna get there, he said not a single thing would have been accomplished except we knew somebody from outside was gonna come in and hold us accountable. And all of a sudden it changed the dynamic. And at, at that point, I just, it, it's not an option anymore. Because again, the accountability piece, it's much easier for somebody from outside to say, did you not do that intentionally or were you just lazy? Whereas a lot of times in our own communities, it's hard for us to uh, call people on the table. And so that's, that's part of that whole process of why uh, you got to have an accountability step in there somewhere. Because if you don't, then people can justify not accomplishing what they wanted to accomplish. So that, that's, that's where that comes in. Other thoughts, questions? I'm gonna, some comments from earlier that I'd like to just uh, uh, head on. So I'm gonna hit some, some, some thoughts, some high points and things. A process for accomplishment, it sounds real simple, but it's critical to being successful. You want to look and have a process that you're going to go through. It's I, I love the gap exercise we did earlier. You know, you, you get to thinking about it. It was pretty simple. Where are you at, in a sense, and where you want to go, and and what's in the middle, and how do we get there? Very much about a process. So so you want to do that. Um, one of the first steps in, 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 in the gap process that I'd like, you know, that, that would look at kind of where you either step before or you step after 
would be that shared vision for the organization. And probably after you do the gap, one of the first steps you'd want to do is develop a, uh, a vision. What does this tell us? But with the vision, then you start having a better understanding of what, what, is, what is the gaps, where we're at. The vision and the goals let us start to see where the larger values and benefits are for our community. What, what a, a number of you asked in the earlier session about how do we bring people together? How do we bring dysfunctional folks together or people that do not are not on the same page? And that's one of the critical things about having a shared goal. People do not have to like each other. They don't even have to be you know, uh, as somebody said, uh, 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 you know, they, 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 I can't remember their wording, but it was kind of, we have some animosity. But if we can get to a place where as a community or as an organization, we have a goal one or two goals. We want our community to grow. We may have different approaches and different reasons, but if we agree that we want our community to grow, then we can come back and start getting everybody on the same page. These are the steps it's gonna to take to grow. And I don't, and, and, and for me, uh, I don't have any purple on today, I'm a K-Stater, but I think about a football team, you have 110 or 20 players together and you know that those 120 players that Bill Snyder used to have on his football teams were not all friends. They were not all buddies. And yet they had a common goal, which was to win a football game. And that's, what you, that's why it's so important to have that vision and the goal. Because now as a community or as an organization, we can start to come together. And once we come together, then progress starts getting made. And I don't care, you know, and, and, and I hope as we go along here in the next few minutes that you throw some very specifics out. Uh, my style, uh, I'm, I'm normally not a lecturer, so I, 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 I work much better with some questions and thoughts and comments, but uh, it, it really is significant that, that if we as, a, as an organization can come together with common goals and a common vision, we will be successful. And if we don't do those things, it's really a gamble and just pure luck if we're gonna be successful. And I'm sure the, you know, the leadership group has probably done some real research on those kind of things. Uh, one, one of the other things to remember for small communities, small organizations, is you wanna keep it real simple uh, because if it gets too complicated, you as the person who is the professional or the hired staff, you're going to get, end up doing all the work and you all have other jobs to do. And so you want to keep it, you want to keep it simple. That's why I, earlier I mentioned, we're really talking about strategic action steps versus strategic planning. Engineering firms will come in and do a great job of strategic planning for you. They'll give you a big book. And in five years, when you move things around in your office, you'll blow the dust off the, off, the, off the book that's never been opened. And so what you wanna do is, is really find out how do we keep it simple? How do we make things, excuse me. Uh, then one, one of the other things is whatever you're doing in your community, once you have that vision, that goal set up, if you're doing a marketing activity, if you're doing a community activity, whatever you're doing, make sure they all tie together and that they have the same purpose. One of the things that has amazed me when I've been in communities and they start showing uh, what marketing's doing, what this group is doing, and there's no tie. You know, if we're gonna accomplish something, let's make every, you know, in the marketing, Let's make sure every document, every piece of material we use ties together. 
and has that same focus. And too many times what we do, and, and we do this with especially our strategic actions, our goals, especially, they're going, they're scattered. So the reality is we lose energy. We don't have the chance to get everything accomplished we want to get accomplished. Said it again, I'll say it again. Uh, planning is a must. You got to have plans. Uh, if you don't, again, when we talk about, there's a number of folks talked about collaboration. If we can bring everybody together and we're focused, collaboration becomes very easy. Not, I should say maybe simple, it's never easy. Um, let me share then a couple of stories that might help this a little bit. Uh, one of them, because it's out of state, I'll, I'll even mention the name, uh, Waynesboro, Pennsylvania. Waynesboro, Pennsylvania has, has a fairly good artist, arts community. They had been trying for probably at least six, six to 10 years to really take and make the arts, uh, they're a small community, uh, 14, 12, probably now not even that, maybe 8,000. 8, they saw that, that the arts could become a real uh, attraction and they could be a point of, a point of a destination point. Went into there and we were doing uh, the process I do. And the first, very first meeting we had, we had about 14 folks from the community that were some way involved in the arts. We had four or five of them literally say, we've done this 10 times, we have made no progress. This is the last time I'm ever gonna do it. And the only way we were able to get the people together is we had that one dedicated radical nut who was so committed that he almost, some of these folks he had to beg to be there. We went through and narrowed down what they wanted to do, set a, a, a vision they went in and their downtown had 15, and this we're talking two and a half blocks by a block. They had 15 vacant buildings, but they said, we want to, we want to make arts a destination. They went to the owners of those 15 buildings. They had six of them who were willing to give them the building to use for a year and let them do whatever they wanted to with that building. The others were saying, one, one guy said, oh, I can't do that. What if somebody wants to rent my building? And, and one of the, the folks on the committee said, you know, your building's been empty for 15 years. What makes you think all of a sudden? So that year in those six buildings, they set up galleries. At the end of the year, all six of those buildings had, were rented and out for usage. They were opened up, people were using them, people were coming in. All six of them were being utilized. Two of them in the arts, the other four by other folks. The next year when they went to open up galleries for the next year, all but two of the vacant building folks wanted to be on the list. And they were only gonna let, I think they were, they were looking at six, six additional ones again. Today, for the last three years, Waynesboro, Pennsylvania, every Friday, Saturday, Sunday, has arts activities going on. They now have like eight galleries that are in town, and it is a destination point for 200 mile radius. They've opened up four new restaurants. And what it did, it was a way for them to finally come together and they had all of these things they'd always talked about, but they never focused it and narrowed it down to one or two or three. The other example, and I'm not gonna give a name, but the community in Kansas went in to work with. And when they had done their vision and came up, they had 35 different activities that they needed to do to move their community forward. 
all of them had some value and forced them and it was a it, uh, they had a council so they had eight council members and a mayor they narrowed that list down to three items and the three items one of them was they needed to do something about their pool They needed to do something, and, and what they said, they needed a, a, a new pipeline to a, to a reservoir. And then they had some land that they had that they needed to develop. And within three years, first of all, on the water issue, instead of it being, and, and they literally, they'd had three votes and talked about putting this pipeline in. Through the discussion, the issue really was the quality of water for the community. They had limited quality of water. The, 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 the water out of the river was really bad. And all of a sudden we changed the conversation to putting in this pipeline to improving the quality of water for the community. They all, all agreed. On the pool, they looked at that and said, you know, if we're gonna make this work, it cannot be a city government project. So what we've got to do is go out and get community leaders to take the lead and be the emphasis of making this happen. And they found four or five mothers, a couple of, uh, and, and, uh, uh, and then the, the third, they, they had a large piece of property that they wanted to develop and they had a housing issue. They had two large manufacturers and probably 90% of the workforce came from outside of 50 miles. So they were getting almost, about the only benefit they were getting was an occasional fill up of gas and a package of cigarettes and some candy at the convenience store. So these three items within five years, all three of those had been accomplished. I think they now have probably 20 new housing, the new pool, and they have changed the whole concept. They're looking at the quality of water. And so they were looking at a, a, a new water uh, filtering process. And that's, and, and, and I think that what was most critical about this, they took those three items, broke them down and put them into a five-year plan, not a one-year plan. Then what was real important at the end of the evening, we went through and asked all nine of the, of the participants, you know, kind of thoughts, other comments. We had three of the council members literally almost came unglued. Their comment was, this is the stupidest thing we've ever done. All 35 of those items need to be accomplished for our community to move forward. And as you do, sometimes you ask sometimes a stupid question, which, and I asked, I said, well, of the 35 items you have up there on the board that you believe need done, how many of them are new? And they'd been doing a process like this internally for like five years. The room went totally silent. And all of a sudden, one of the commissioners held up his finger. There was one new item on that list. And I said, think about this. If you'd have accomplished three of those each of the last five years, where would you be today? Because what they were doing, they were going into the, to the city staff, a different commissioner every day asking them, why aren't you working on this when they had that list of 35? And so they bounced back and forth and never, nothing ever got totally accomplished. So when, when, when you, all, all of us, there's not an organization that doesn't have a whole lot of stuff. And especially if we're in rural Kansas, we've got a lot of things that we need to do for our community. But we're not gonna accomplish any of them if we keep the list too big. And so for each of your communities, you need to be looking at and coming up and saying, what are the three that bring us the most value? or get us started on where it is we want to be to reach our vision. And that's the step that so many times we don't do. We have way more than we can accomplish, 
And we've got to remember what happened, you know, if, if we just accomplish one each year, in 10 years, we've accomplished 10 major things for our community. Whereas if we have a list of 10 that we're working on every year and nothing gets accomplished, at the end of 10 years, we got a big zero. We've maybe moved some things a little bit. We've shifted them. We've increased. And, and, and the other thing that happens, and, and you know, we talked about this whole involvement level, momentum is extremely important. If you can take one or two activities that bring real value to your community and successfully accomplish them, the momentum starts to build. People look and say, oh, that's a group I want to be involved with. They're accomplishing something. Those are the people that I want to, want to do work with. Whereas if every time, at the end of every year, people look and say, well, we did a lot of feel good things, but we really didn't do anything that brought much value. That's when people pull back. And once, once your community starts seeing that you're being successful, then you start getting more and more people engaged and involved in, in what's going on. One of, the, one of the thoughts is, you know, you want to do the right thing, not things right. And I think that's, a, that's an issue a lot of us work with. We want to do, the, do things right. So if we're going to do something, oh, I got to really do it well. Well, there's some things that don't need much, <laughs> you know, at 80%. If I can spend a third of the time and get 80% what needs done, that's, that's okay. But what I wanna do is look at the right things. And this is where that vision and those goals gives us the capability to understand what are the right things I should be working on for my organization and my community, not just doing things right. Because a lot of doing things right is busy work. Uh, The, 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 again, that a lot of that goes back to the us versus them that somebody mentioned. And in that us versus them, what you want to do is get us and them all to agree what we want to accomplish. And then we can be button heads on a lot of things, but if, if our goal and our vision for the community and, and, and what has been amazing to me with so many of the communities I've worked with when you get down and really talk about it, most of them want the same things for their community. It's how they approach it. And so the arguments come in because somebody has an approach and is more concerned with selling their approach than accomplishing the goal. And so when you look out there and you see you're having a lot of struggles with an individual within your community, sometimes find out why is that going on? And an awful lot of the time, it's going to be what, you know, it's, it's not going to be the end goal. It's going to be all the little things that, that, I, that don't matter as much. Okay, I've gone, like I said, I, I normally don't, don't talk much, or I talk a lot, but I don't. Uh, any other questions that anybody has out there? Would like to throw the uh, and carry maybe back to you, but let's let's throw the the uh, group open for just any kind of discussions or thoughts or suggestions for carry or any of us. I think after going through this process uh, with Raquel, you've given us a lot to think about. Um, John, on how to now take a lot of this and go back and really dig deep into the priorities and why they're priorities. Um, and looking at really what's holding up a community and making things move forward. You know, yeah. is it really that we don't have the money or is it that we've lost momentum? And if we've lost the momentum, why? So that's and, interesting. And, 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 and Carrie, I think part of what you're saying, what, what, and I can't emphasize enough, it really comes down to narrowing your focus. You've got to have one or two things that you really want to accomplish because then you can get people on board. 
if you've got more than, I mean, I, I almost never, we'll never do more than three because if you do that, then also you start scattering your resources. So yeah, okay, back to you, Carrie. <laughs> Now that, yeah, it's making me think back how many different times, yeah, you've got 35 things and you try to do a little bit on 35, it takes so much more that if you really just concentrate on what, that makes a lot of sense. Yeah. Well, and I'll test to what John was talking about too. He actually facilitated the strategic planning uh, session with a community that I used to work for um, a while back. And, um, they did some of the good things that you talked about and some of the not so great things. Um, but one of the things I think that um, I found incredibly helpful was, again, like you said, making sure that that your team really is um, crafted together that's joining you. Make sure you have the right people in the room, um, but make sure that group is small and intimate that they can make those decisions and really think that through. Um, it, it makes a really big difference um, as to whether or not, if, 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 it, if you have a group of 40 people, you're not gonna, look, gonna get a lot accomplished because there's gonna be too much side chatter happening. Um, but really making sure that that's really um, directly thought through and, and like, like John had really outlined um, and make sure the right people are in the room that are actually gonna be implementing this and making those decisions. If you don't have the people who are, who are directly responsible for, putting the money to whatever you come up with and making those budget decisions, you're probably not gonna get a whole lot um, farther either. So uh, I, I can't wait to see what everyone does. Um, I, I encourage everyone too, to, to reach out to, to John or Raquel um, as you're going through your process in your community to, to talk more about uh, what you might need uh, as they move forward. We've got a couple of uh, comments of thank you for the great information, John, in the chat. So definitely um, appreciate that. And so there's kind of a question kind of as we're talking on the momentum thought, John. So another thing that came up when we were doing our gap, though, what pulled people back is kind of, you know, the, the naysayers or the negative. So how do you generally approach? You can't necessarily ignore, especially as Carrie and Sam brought up, social media. So how do you change that language when people are, you know, really pushing the, well, we've already done it or it's never going to work and make that twist to a positive? Usually for me, it's, it's, getting, it's getting that, again, going to the very basic, getting the vision. And then, because then you can ask the person, are you saying you don't want our community to look this way? Are you saying you don't want our community to grow? You can start, that gives you a chance to narrow it down. Why are you a naysayer? What is it? And most of the time, what you find out, and I don't know how better to say this, it's very selfish reasons. But if you've got that vision, then you can go out and ask them, what is it about the vision you don't like? Whenever we have the opportunity to move things to the issue and away from the personality, we're gonna be much more successful. Most of us, and I, I, have, I have been at this point many times, I get mad at the individual and I wanna take on the individual. What I wanna do is find out what is it that the individual doesn't like about the vision. And then I can start addressing how do I work with them? And that's why having visions and having goals are helpful because then I'm going back to that, that naysayer with the whole concept. Now, again, tell me why you don't want a new swimming pool. Well, my God, my taxes are going to go up. Well, let's, let's talk about how we're going to fund it. Oh, I didn't know you were going to do that. And so many times our naysayers are people that <laughs> are semi-informed. They know just enough that they picked up at the coffee shop to know they're not gonna like it. So instead of dealing with the real issue, they're dealing with the coffee shop discussion. That's probably very true. 
yeah, making it about the topic and the issue and not yeah. who is saying it. And let's see, Rick helped just put a comment in the chat. The movable middle, focusing on folks. One that will never persuade. Yep. <laughs> no coffee shop. Sometimes there is a benefit to that then. <laughs> so, well, thank you very much. We've got about one minute left to go. Did you have something to add, Raquel, real quick? I saw you unmuted there for a second. <laughs> Nothing of substance, really. <laughs> <laughs> I was just going to say, I'm pretty sure Iowa has a like McDonald's. <laughs> <laughs> I was going to say, they're going to find another place. The, 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 the co-op is what it was in, in Kiowa, where I grew up. They hung out the co-op. There's always yeah. that place. <laughs> Excellent. Well, thanks for everybody who joined. Again, thank you very much, Raquel, John, and Jarrett for your help today and all this great information. Um, as we mentioned before, the session is recorded. So then when you want to go back and re-listen to see kind of how the process, the thoughts, uh, we'll have that. And then we'll also try to share some of the a breakdown of the handouts as well. So we can post those previews um, in the future as well. Um, and, and if you have any questions, yes, John, go ahead. Yeah, are you going to send out if, if you want to anybody, if they want to, if you want to email, email me a question, I'm more than happy to interact with anybody so please feel comfortable and i think carrie can uh, you know if you if you want to send that out i'm happy to talk to folks or email back and forth or give a call on the phone absolutely fine yeah so and and hopefully for everybody that's on intentional really in having this is our opening session for our ed201 so the next five sessions, we're going to really be talking more about um, those topics. So next, we're going to have some a good lineup of speakers talking about funding um, programs, but really key about how to use some of the programs that are available to rural communities and examples of how those were implemented. Um, so as you're really kind of identifying what those primary goals for moving forward in your community are going to be, um, over the next five Thursday afternoons, we'll hopefully be giving you some really good resources, contacts, and some thoughts on how to move some of these priorities forward. Um, and if anyone has any questions that you are curious about any of the topics, so they're all on our website at our grassroots um, website that we need to make sure that you'll have as well. Then you can kind of see where those are. So if you have any questions, you can forward this way. With that, we are one minute over, but I appreciate everybody hanging in there and thank you for your participation in today's session. Bye-bye. Have a great afternoon. Thanks, everyone.